So when we talk about hypertension, we're talking about blood pressure that's gotten beyond the normal limits. Now, this might seem like a really simple topic to discuss, but it affects millions of Americans, and it's really important that we understand the implications and what we as nurses can do to treat it. First, let's talk really quick about what blood pressure is. Now, there are three main parameters that we need to know. Systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and mean arterial pressure, or MAP. First, systolic blood pressure is the pressure exerted in the vessels when the heart contracts. So it contracts, it forces blood out into the arteries, and that is a there's a pressure within that arteries during that time. Diastolic blood pressure is the pressure within the vessels between beats or when the heart is relaxing during diastole. So when we report a blood pressure, we report systolic over diastolic. So it would be like 120 over 80. The third metric is mean arterial pressure or MAP. You'll see this a lot when we talk about vasopressor medications or in patients with neuro disorders. It's a calculation of the average pressure within the arterial system. So it looks at the full cardiac cycle and takes the average pressure within the vessels. Now, sometimes you'll also hear us mention pulse pressure. What we mean by pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic, or SBP minus DBP. It gives us an idea of how hard the heart's working, and we use it a lot in like neuro or cardiac patients. So what are the ranges for blood pressure? Well, this table is based on the 2017 American Heart Association guidelines, and they've actually removed the term prehypertension and lowered the threshold for diagnosis. The hope is that people can begin receiving treatment sooner. So normal is less than 120 over less than 80. If your systolic goes above 120, you're considered to have elevated blood pressure. Stage one is 130 to 39 over 80 to 89. Stage two is over 140 over over 90. And then you start hitting hypertensive crisis when your systolic gets above 180 and or your diastolic gets above 120. Now we're gonna dive really deep into hypertensive crisis in the case study that's attached to this lesson. So make sure you check that out. Now, one thing that's really important to note here is that these pressures need to be accurate. So we need to make sure that we have the right cuff size. If our cuff is too big or too small, we can get false low or false high readings. And we don't want to treat the patient based on a number that's not accurate. So if you check out the care plan attached to this lesson, you can see more details about sizing the cuff. So what causes hypertension? Well, we have two kinds. We have primary hypertension and secondary hypertension. Primary doesn't have a specific cause, while secondary is caused by some other condition. So what does cause primary hypertension? Well, there's quite a few risk factors, but what we want you to see here is that some are non-modifiable and some are modifiable. So non-modifiable means there's nothing the patient can do about it. So this is things like increasing age, family history, history or race. Um, in fact, African Americans tend to have higher risk of hypertension than other races. Now then, modifiable risk factors, this is something that the patient can change. We'll talk about this a lot when we talk about patient education. These are things like obesity, smoking. This is a huge one. If your patient smokes, they need to stop like today. Stress, that increases cortisol levels, which can put stress on the heart. Um, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, or atherosclerosis. Those are all things that can cause blood pressure to increase because the heart's pumping against those blocked or hardened vessels. And then dietary things like salt intake can increase water retention or caffeine intake, which causes vasoconstriction. All those things can cause hypertension and put stress on the heart. Now with secondary hypertension, the most common things that can cause it are pregnancy. We'll see this in OB when we talk about uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia. Renal disorders and cardiovascular disorders, which actually tend to exacerbate each other. Remember us talking about the cycle of death with the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system? And then diabetes. Diabetes at its core is a vascular disorder, so it can cause a lot of stress um, on the vascular system. When it comes to symptoms, the reality of hypertension is that sometimes there are no symptoms until it starts causing end organ damage. So sometimes we'll see it called the silent killer. Someone may not check their blood pressure regularly and they have no idea that they have hypertension until they have significant problems. Some of the later signs would be like vision changes um, because of the effect on the pressure within the vessels in the eyes. Then we'll also see frequent headaches and dizziness because of the pressure in the brain and even chest pain and angina because of the stress on the heart. 
The biggest thing we see as end organ damage and the ways that this can cause significant problems for our patients are things like strokes, renal failure, heart failure, or myocardial infarction. You may have a patient present with the worst headache of their life and blurry vision and turns out their blood pressure is 240 over 120 and they have had a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, so her blood pressure did not just go from 120 over 80 and suddenly go up to 240 over 120. This happens gradually, okay? So we need to stress how important it is that our patients get their blood pressure checked at least annually. They can even just go down to CVS and have it checked for free. Now, when it comes to medication management, the goal for hypertension is to address the blood pressure with multiple mechanisms. The goal being to decrease the stress on the vessels in multiple ways. Most hypertension patients will be on at least two of these medications. So we've got ACE inhibitors, that's our prills like captopril, and our ARBs, that's our sartans like losartan. Both of these are gonna prevent water retention and lead to vasodilation so we can block that RAAS and allow for the blood pressure to decrease. We've got beta blockers like our OLOLs like metoprolol. Those are gonna slow down the heart rate and contractility so that we can ultimately decrease the blood pressure. We've got calcium channel blockers. Those are our peens like nicardipine. These are gonna help relax smooth muscle and you'll get vasodilation. So again, that helps decrease the blood pressure. And then we also have diuretics. These are our, our ides like furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide. So we give them a combination of these to help address their blood pressure, prevent end organ damage. However, there is so much that the patient can do themselves to improve their hypertension. So patient education is a must. Like we talked about it with the modifiable risk factors. There's a lot that patients can do to decrease their risk and prevent complications. And these are mostly diet and lifestyle changes. Remember what the number one change is? smoking cessation. This is so important and it will make a huge impact in a short period of time. We'll also teach them the DASH diet. This is a low sodium diet. They need to learn how to avoid things like processed foods, canned foods. They need to not add salt to their foods, all that. They should also decrease their caffeine intake and decrease their stress. This is way easier said than done, isn't it? I hope they're not nursing students. Um, so, also, anything they can do to reduce their weight, like diet, exercise, even things like yoga are fantastic because they also help to increase or decrease stress. The point is, it's our role as the nurse to empower patients with this information. They can make a huge difference in their own lifestyle if they're just willing to be a part of it. Now, we'll cover more specific nursing interventions in the care plan attached to this lesson. But just to recap, the top three priority concepts are going to be perfusion, because obviously this is a perfusion issue, and then health promotion and patient education are going to be key for these patients. And it's a huge role um, for us as nurses. So remember, the normal blood pressure ranges have been shifted down recently so we can have earlier intervention. So make sure you familiarize yourself with those new guidelines. Secondary hypertension is caused by another disorder, but primary hypertension is manageable and it may be preventable. When patients are put on medications, we aim at decreasing the blood pressure through multiple mechanisms. Like I said, they'll usually be on at least two of those medications. That way we can have the biggest impact. Remember that patients may not experience any symptoms until there's end organ damage, so they need to be monitoring their blood pressure. And then we have to remember that we are on the front lines here and we have to teach them how to take care of themselves. And so we make that patient education a top priority for these patients. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.